People much beloved by God, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Last week I told you that I realized there's a pattern in the texts for Lent. Each one deals with a character who encounters Jesus in an amazing way and receives greater blessings than they ever could have asked for. The first week, Nicodemus, the teacher, came to Jesus and he was taught, Last week, the woman at the well came for temporal water, thirsting, and received living water. Now Jesus encounters a blind man who wanted to see. Returning sight is no small miracle. The text tells us that never from creation had anyone ever been heard of having their sight returned. It caused quite the commotion in the community. Now we know that Jesus heals the blind on six individual separate times throughout the Gospels. There are at least two other times whenever large groups come to him and it was reported that the blind had their sight restored. So now the neighbors are all asking questions. How did this happen? Is this really the guy that we knew? Was this man the same or wasn't he? Well, he was only a beggar. Why would God notice him? Was it the sin of the man or his parents that made him blind in the first place? The stories began to fly, and what's even more disturbing disturbing was the report that he was healed by this Jesus of Nazareth. The Pharisees had already decided to excommunicate anyone who confessed to be a follower of Jesus. So how could he be doing miracles if he was such a bad guy? Well, when this text is taken slowly, it becomes harder and harder to tell who is blind and who is not. The spiritual and the physical are so intertwined in this text that they become inseparable. In the beginning, it's obvious that the man who was born blind is the one who's blind. But then by the end of the text, it kind of looks like it's those Pharisee guys. The ones who can't see past their own piety. They're in spiritual blindness. Blindness is a sort of metaphor that we hear about a lot in Christianity. And of course, we all know lots of hymns that have to do with blindness. Not least among these would be Amazing Grace. Many of us even know the story of the writer John Newton, how he was a slave trader who was caught in a storm and prayed that God would deliver him. And after surviving, he became a Christian and an abolitionist. He wrote the song Amazing Grace because his own heart echoed what the blind man in this passage said, I once was blind, but now I see. And he was right. Apart from Christ... In our sin, all of us are are blind. Apart from Christ, we cannot see. There are several ways in which we cannot see, in which our blindness affects us. First of all, we can't see ourselves. Now, that's a physical reality. You cannot see yourself right now at this moment. And it's a physical fact as much as it's a spiritual one. Now, sure, there are mirrors, but size and shape, light and smudges distort the image. And then there's photography. You can always look at a picture of yourself, right? But then again, everyone knows that the camera adds 10 pounds. In my case, sometimes it adds 15 or 20. And ironically, our physical inability to see ourselves reflects our spiritual inability to see ourselves. Perhaps you're unable to see your own value. Years of smudges on your character have left you with a self-perception that's hard to see. Maybe the darkness of your actions has left your perception of yourself too dark. On the other hand, maybe you have a conflated image of yourself. A spiritual extra 10 pounds, if you will. 
like the Pharisees, you are more concerned about what your neighbor is doing than your inability to see your own sin. If right now you're thinking, oh yeah, pastor's definitely talking about that guy over there, you fit into this category. Second, we cannot see our neighbors. We forget that the second and the greatest of the commandments is to love your neighbor as yourself. We forget that, as Luther put it, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor surely does. We forget that God has put our neighbors nearest to us so that we may serve them. Instead, we ignore them, like all the people who are walking past the blind man. We get distracted by living our daily lives. We get so focused on things that aren't necessarily bad or evil, but they do become our idols. Earning money, moving up the ladder at work, driving the kids to soccer practice. These things are not evil, but if you aren't careful, you can let them distract you from what God is actually calling you to do. Or on the other hand, perhaps you're getting distracted with the work that you believe God wants you to do. We want to gain members for our congregation, but are we concerned for their needs or our numbers? We want to get back to how things were before COVID, but are those ministries and those events still what the community needs? Are they still good for the service of our neighbor? Or do they need to be sacrificed so that God can bring us to something new? We want to enjoy what was comfortable and good from before, but we do it at the expense of what God has set before us. We want to be in charge of our neighbor so that we can make our neighbor do our things, our ways. You know, for our own good. I mean, their own good. This applies in our homes, how we raise our kids and interact with our spouses. It applies to politics. That's why there's a two-party system, not a single party. And it certainly applies in the church. That's why we have to have church council meetings at all. We look for every possible way to make the neighbor serve us rather than serving them because we are blind to their needs. Third, we cannot see our own God. Now, it's hard to believe that we cannot see God if he's right in front of us. Then again, maybe it's not so hard to believe. If we can't see ourselves and our neighbors, after all, God is unknowable, right? He gives us a book full of rules that are hard enough to understand, let alone to do. We're supposed to hear his voice in these small whispers and in good feelings, but then we have to spend hours debating how we know what is God and what is gas. Would a God who is so good be so cryptic, so cruel? After all, it is God who makes some to see and leaves some who are blind. C.S. Lewis once said, I believe in God like I believe in the sun, not because I can see him, but because by his light I see everything else. Mark this moment. C.S. Lewis is by far my favorite author of all time. I love the Chronicles of Narnia. My favorite book is Till We Have Faces. I've read so many of his theology works, it's not even funny. There's an entire shelf taken up in our house that is based on C.S. Lewis. And yet today I'm going to disagree with him. I believe that God can be seen as much as the sun can be seen in the sky. Maybe you don't get a direct look at it. Maybe you can't see it in the same way that you see me here before you, but it can be seen just as God can be seen. Maybe not as you see me standing before you, but in the ways that he has promised to reveal himself. Of course, we can see God's workmanship in the rocks and the trees and the flowers and the bees. But why would we look there? 
when he has promised to be here, to be in this place, to reveal himself through his son. We see God in his word, the word that tells you you are forgiven for the sake of Christ and him crucified. We see him in the water that tells you you were marked as a child in his kingdom. We see him in bread and wine that tell you that his body and blood were broken for you for the forgiveness of your sins. These are gifts that are as finite and physical as mud. And they deliver benefits and blessings far more infinite and mystical than the return of the gift of sight. God has revealed himself to us in his Son so that we may believe. Now, Lewis is half right. Because once we have seen God, once we know him, once we believe in our baptism, we can see everything else. Suddenly, you can see your neighbor, whom God has put in your path to serve, the one who is nearest to you, the one who just so happens to need those talents and those gifts that you have been blessed with. The one who could never, ever be helped by anybody else. The one you could ima- never imagine helping in the first place. Because why would you want to help them? Except in Christ, you realize that they were put there for you. The one that God used to teach you something about himself. And maybe, just maybe, he uses them to teach you something about Yourself. And now you can see yourself. Not as you thought you ought to be, not as your expectations tell you you should be. Maybe now you see yourself not as you ought to be, but exactly as you are. Maybe having your sin brought before your eyes has showed you your need for a Savior. And that Savior shows you that despite the dark and smudged reflection of yourself, despite the inflated ego or the deflated self-worth, you are forgiven, in fact, for the sake of Christ and Him crucified. Though once you were lost, now you are found. Though once you were blind, now you see. Amen. Hello, I'm Vicar Aaron Dawson, and I hope that you heard comfort, forgiveness, and the promises of Christ in this sermon. For more sermon videos like this, information about our church, and promises of Christ, you can visit us at sjlcmetro.com. That's sjlcmetro.com. Thank you. And God bless you and keep you in his grace.